Hey everyone, how's it going? And welcome back to another of our Hands On With Max On Beginner Cinema 4D workshops in version 25. As always, I'm joined with Matt. How's it going, Matt? It goes okay, thank you. We have once again, actually, we have sun again. This is like the fourth week in a row that we've done this, and we have sun on a I Wednesday. Know. We are going to have to just when, when we're inside. Yeah, I know. Yes, when we're stuck inside, <laughs> but we're here with you all, so we're happy to be here, of course. Absolutely. So, hey to everyone who's saying hello as well. Hey to Jay, hey to Logan and Sue. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, and um, depending where you're all from. So quick reminder, um, the idea of this course is to get you guys comfortable in Cinema 4D in just six weeks. So, you know, me and Matt broke this down into six things that we think are the most important topics when starting your Cinema 4D journey. And so far, we've gone through uh, weeks one, two and three, which were getting started in Cinema 4D, um, modelling and lighting and materials. And just as a quick reminder for anyone who is kind of looking to catch up on those recordings if I just come over to my Google Chrome we actually have as a training team our own YouTube channel and so all you have to do is search Max on training team on YouTube and then if you come to our homepage, scroll all the way down where it says hands on with Max on you can actually catch up with parts one two or three if you want to and the project files are also linked in there as well so let's get back to my little presentation so what are we going to be doing this week? So as we can see, week four is animation and dynamics. So we're going to be looking at some uh, really fun stuff today. So the idea uh, of kind of the next two hours is to learn how to animate inside of Cinema 4D and how to set up things that are called keyframes. Um, that will be like an automatic way and a manual way as well. We're also going to understand F curves and like what they are and how we can adjust them. And of course, what the Cinema 4D timeline is. Uh, we may get around to some simple camera animation techniques as well. And uh, we're also going to learn all about Cinema 4D's really powerful dynamic system. So we're going to look at rigid body and collider body. There are two other things which are called um, soft body dynamics and cloth, which you may have heard of, but we won't get around to those um, today. But if you do have questions on those, then feel free to let us know or, you know, drop us an email at uh, trainingatmaxon.net. And then, as you know, if you've been here before, we like to do a technical section and a practical section. And so the practical section, we're going to be creating our own kind of inflating balloon text scene. And then if we have time, which is why it's in italics at the end, we might dive into Cinema 4D's emitter um, and kind of mix it in with some dynamics as well. As always, let us know your questions throughout the whole of this session. We'll be answering those live or just sort of shout us out and say, hey, let us know where you're from. Um, we always like to keep this super interactive. Um, and yeah, Matt, are you ready to take the screen on? I will. Uh, if I can also, morning to uh, Pamela. Uh, hey to Jarvis. Vasilis, all the way from uh, Greece. We've got North Carolina. Yes, the, the always sunny Greece. I saw. I was just like, yeah, it's it's all right for Sam. <laughs> You're lucky. To be fair, we have been lucky. Yeah, that's true. We're doing all right for the moment. Can't complain too much. Right. Okay. Let's have a look then. So, Cinema 4D R25. We're going to be looking at animating. So, as Elliot stated, there are a couple of different ways of animating inside of Cinema 4D. Um, manual keyframing, um, parameter manual keyframing, and automatic keyframing. Okay, that was three different ways, but they're, they're very similar. Um, so, let's look at the basics really, really fast. I'm going to create myself a cube. Here it is. I'm going to move it to the left hand side, and I'm going to do the manual keyframing first. And I'm going to press this button record active objects. There we go. That is keyframed. We can tell because I've got this little white box here under my blue slider that says there is a keyframe here. And also if I go to my coordinates tab of my object, you can see that I have all of these keyframed. Now this is because this button here, the, the record active object, if I hover over it, you will see it states this will record the position, scale, rotation and PLA, which is point level animation of active objects. So it will record each one of those all of the time. It won't do any more than that by default. Um, you can set it to do more than that by default. Um, 
but at the moment it is just going to do those so you can even record animated and hierarchies and stuff but to be honest we're going to simplify this and just keep it to the, the bog standard of it will record those three so i have my timeline i have my keyframe i have my object i can confirm that this is done i'm going to use my scrubber which is the blue time scrubber to go all the way to the right hand side you can see that my little animation dots diamonds um now are red but they're not solid red this lets me know that there is an animation track somewhere um or there is an animation track for each of these individual items and there we might in generally should be a keyframe somewhere but the keyframe is not here you see if i scrub all the way around here if i scrub all the way around here no they don't change but if i go back to the beginning they become the solid red dot because i'm over my keyframe so if i go to the right hand side the end of my timeline and i press my keyframe button you guessed it they will solidify because they are now um keyframed again but I have two keyframes of my cube in exactly the same place. So I'm just going to press undo for that. Dunk. So that I have not keyframed. And then, so back to where I was, which is I have my keyframe at the beginning and no keyframe at the end. Go to the end, grab my cube, move it to the right hand side. Now we have something slightly different here. All of the others are red except one, which is orange or amber depending on what you want to go. This is amber because it is a warning. You have updated this information, but you have yet to record it. So all of these have stayed the same because nothing has changed in the actual information, but this one has because I've moved the cube. And this one now has an amber thing. So this is saying, if I don't do anything, it will forget it. So if I move my timeline, there it goes, it pings back because this is where the last keyframe was. So if I actually want it to animate from one side of the screen to the other, I will take my timeline bump, and I will move it there. I will move my cube from one side to the other bump, and then I will press the keyframe button ping. There we go. These have all gone red because there is now a keyframe here. If I go back, obviously it wouldn't be. And I now have this line. This is my animation track. And each one of these individual dots is actually a frame. And you can see that there is more frames at one end than there is the, uh, than in the middle and more frames at the other end. This is because Cinema 4D will automatically um, apply a principle of animation for you called ease in and ease out, which means to kind of replicate how fact the way life works, um, things start off slowly, speed up and then slow down again. This is one of the principles of animation as created by Disney sometime in the 30s. Um, so that's one of the things that they do. Uh, and that's one of the things Cinema 4D does for us. So now if I press play, my cube starts off slowly, speeds up and then slows down again. It's, it doesn't like grind to a halt very slowly, but it does slow down before it hit, reaches the end. And you can see the difference in the speed and it starts off slowly, it speeds up and then it slows down again. Now that is the basic of keyframing. Um, but the truth is I've actually keyframed a hell of a lot of stuff that I didn't need, like the scale, like rotation. In fact, X and Y, X, uh, y and Z positions here. Um, so let's create something. So let's just move that up in the middle and then press the keyframe button again. Dunk. So now you can see my animation track adjusts to go from one side to the other. And it now takes in, into account that information in the middle, the fact that I'm now rising on the Y axis and then going back down again. So that very, very simply is how to do manual keyframes inside of Cinema 4D. Now, as stated, it will only do position, scale, and rotation. It does say point level animation, but to be honest, nobody seriously does point level animation with this anymore. Um, if you say, can I change the color with this? The answer is no, uh, not by default. Uh, like, can I? change this and like, like it will only record position scale and rotation and that's the scale so if i actually change the size of my cube and i go back to the beginning of my animation you will see that the size of my cube stays the same because the size of my cube is an attribute here and as you can see it's not position scale or rotation so therefore will not be recorded if i did want to record it then I could use this individual parameter. So I can actually click this record button 
uh, just to do the correct one, that would help, wouldn't it? Which is the size of Y, which is the one that I'm changing. So if I want this to be 30 to start with, and then I want it to grow or shrink or whatever, um, if I press this button, it won't do it. So what I can do, I can set this as a keyframe by clicking on the diamond itself with my left mouse button. Boom. There you go. You can now see that I have a red keyframe. That means this is recorded. So now I can go all the way to the end. I, because I want it to be a smooth transition from beginning to end, I don't have to set a keyframe in the middle. So let's go to the very end of my animation again. Let's set that back to 200 and let's keyframe. Dunk. And now if I go back to the beginning, press play, you can see that that creates a, a growth effect. And this, as I say, is a parameter keyframe. So it's a manual keyframe with a parameter. There's no auto keyframing going on. If I want to change anything or do anything, I'm going to have to redo that at the moment. So let's go to the end of my animation and say, actually, I didn't want it to go to 30. I only want, sorry, 200. I wanted it to go to 150. I've got that red, uh, amber warning again. That says there's a keyframe here. You've changed something. If you don't re-record it, I'll forget it. So you click that button again, dunk, it goes red. It lets you know that that is now going to be the value that it will get to from 30 to 150. And that is parameter keyframing. Parameter keyframing, as you can see, will be enabled if there is one of these little animation dots by the value that you wish to keyframe, which you will notice it's about 95% of the things inside of Cinema 4D. You can keyframe so much stuff. Now that's a goodish place to stop, I think, to see if anybody has any questions thus far. Um, yes, we have at one. So Daniel was wondering, uh, why can't that be done with scale? Um, because the scale of an object is slightly different from the size. So a scale is a proportional thing and it's different from a size because this is a parametric object. Its size is determined by its um, height, width and depth. If I was to make this object editable, dunk, I now no longer have access to its height, width and depth. So it will now stay the same size. So now in theory, I could, if I wanted to, use the scale tool and scale it up and then re-keyframe and then go to the end and shrink it down and re-keyframe. And I should not get a size change. That's interesting. That's really weird. Why is that not, oh, am I on the wrong? Object mode. There we go. That's why. Rookie mistake. So make sure you change your tool to did object you mode. You did it on purpose. That was it. Absolutely. <laughs> All of my mistakes are on purpose, so you can see what's supposed to happen. Um, and you can see that because I'd previously keyframed here when I'd recorded height, width, and depth, my transition doesn't actually start until 45, and then it transitions to. 90 frames so that's why so a parametric object is controlled by its parameters whereas a non-parametric object a polygonal object can be changed and recorded with its scale cool thanks that's uh, all right can you animate the original point or pivot point independently of the object an application would be for example if you want to move a rolling box mm -hmm. No, you can't. You can't animate a pivot point moving. At least I don't think you can. I'm changing yeah, its coordinates. Yeah, you'd have to do it with a null or several nulls to rotate around each individual null, I think, if you wanted to have a box tumbling. Um, but I don't think you can actually keyframe a pivot point moving. 
because in theory that would do something really weird yeah no you can't animate a pivot point moving you would have to have multiple pivot points or null objects in order to do a box rolling cool uh thanks can That's you fine. change from one primitive to another for example, a cube into a sphere in this way. I'm not sure I understand the question. So I think when you were doing the, um, uh, when you were keyframing all the parameters, could you keyframe a um, cube into a sphere shape? No. Well, actually saying that, from a fillet. That's the only thing I think I could do. It's not pleasant, I'm not going to lie. Maybe. I'm not sure I'd recommend it, but I'd need, oh, that's cool. I'd need to increase the number of subdivisions to make it smoother. So, kind yeah, of kind of. But I wouldn't want to try and do it with anything else. <laughs> cool. Anything else? To look through. So yeah, Logan was saying about the set of nulls as well. Um, can you parent more than one null to an object? Yes. We're going back to the rolling cube, aren't we? Um, <laughs> Technically, you'd have nested nulls, wouldn't you? Yeah. So if I've got a cube and I'm just going to make groups because it's easier. Um, using this tool, which is the axis modification tool, I could move the null and I am just guessing. Um, and that one. I need to hold seven because I need to move the null individually. This is the trouble when you don't see nulls. I mean, they're a rough guess, so I'm just going to do that. If I hold down seven, what seven does is it allows me to move the parent of an object without moving the child. So if I was to move this null without holding down seven and I move it over there. Oh, then the other null didn't change. Oh, it's because I'm on an axis tool. Oh, that's cleverer than I thought it was. Normally with an, if you're using any other form of object, it won't let you do that. I'm not quite sure how well that would go though. So technically I've got four nulls, but and then I could turn that tool off. And then I'd rotate around that one. Or I could rotate around that one. But it might be a bit clumsy. Anyway. Yes, you can have cool. multiple objects. Cool. cool, thanks. Yeah, that was all the questions that came in for now. But yeah, everyone, keep them coming. OK. So let's have a look then at automatic keyframing. Now, automatic keyframing is very similar to manual keyframing, um, except you have to turn this on first, which is auto keyframing. Now, there's been a change to auto keyframing in the last couple of versions. You used to be able to just move that from one side to another and it would create the keyframes for you. However, in an effort to be more standardized to other applications, you have to set a keyframe first. So if I move that over here, and I know that that's my X coordinates, I'm gonna create a keyframe here. Now with auto keyframing on, if I go to the end of my animation and move it, boom, can you see it's auto keyframed? I haven't had to do anything else because it's keyframed it. And if I just go into the middle and I plop that up, ooh, Oh, of course. Sorry. Yeah, I'm explaining it, aren't I? If I move that up, why is it not keyframing it in the middle like it did before? Well, the answer is because this is yet to be keyframed. So Cinema 4D is just going, well, this is not an animated track. 
so therefore I will not understand that this hasn't changed. So I will simply move the whole animation up, which is not what I wanted to do. If I did want to have the thing going up, what I would need to do is also, at the beginning of my animation, set a keyframe for the Y coordinates. So then when I get to 45 and I say, actually, I want you to go up there, can you see it's gone, ooh, okay, right, I get it, I'll move that up here. And because there was no keyframe set for the Y coordinates at the end, it just carries on the rest of the animation at that particular height. Um, and I can move it there or I can move it back down again. And then it will just go ping and it will record itself. Now, again, as I said before, if I change like the size of my object, none of this will be recorded until I set a keyframe here. And then if I then go to the end of my animation and I shrink that down, you can now see that's recorded and I have a cube that changes size as well. So auto keyframing is slightly different and it's just a little bit of a different mentality to think about, but auto keyframing will keyframe anything and everything that you ask it to. So even to the point where I go, right, let's stick a material on my cube, dunk in my material, let's put a tick in the box of the color there. And then at halfway through my animation, let's make it red. And then at the end of my animation, let's make it blue. And then press play. And so now it goes, doom, doom, doom. And it changes three colors. And I've had to do very little. Now, auto keyframing is very useful for character animation because you don't have to keep pressing the keyframe button over and over and over and over again. Um, it would do a lot of stuff for you. But you do need to be aware of what you are doing. It makes it it's a li little less tricky than it was uh, when it come when it than it used to be rather. But if you pick a color here and go, mm, I don't know, maybe I like green, and then you're looking through your animation and go, oh, actually, maybe I like yellow there, and and then looking through, actually, actually, what I really wanted it was it to be blue. Um, it goes a bit techno because you've been on a different frame each time, so thus it's recorded all of them. However, if you don't want those anymore. Uh, if I click above where the where, where the numbers are, I move my time slider. If I click where the same level as my little white keyframes and click and drag, I can select my keyframes and they go orange because they're highlighted. I can press delete and they go away again. So that is a, a quick timeline. Um, I'm going to go into the timeline a little bit more in a second um, because it's really useful and you need to know what's going on. But are there any questions about auto keyframing? There's nothing. Oh, I may have lied. What if you want to move the animation in another place? Like if you've animated a bouncing ball and you want it to bounce in another place. I know I can do it using nulls, but is there another way? Mm. Yes, I think so. Um, which is here. So under model mode and object mode, technically you've got animation mode and I can, I thought, or you, yes, I can. I don't know why it wasn't clicking there. Um, I can move the animation in either of the directions that it has been keyframed in. So if I wanted to, I would need to go back to the beginning and keyframe the Z position so that I could then move the whole thing into a different way using the animation mode up here. Translate the animation curve in the viewport, so it says. So basically it allows you to move your animation. Next. Cool. Yeah, so Rick just asked um, a really good question, actually. When you click, so when you were clicking and dragging to select um, the keyframes on your timeline and then you deleted it, wouldn't you yep. risk deleting keyframes for other parameters that might be among your color keyframes? And you wouldn't, which is handy. Um, because they only yeah, show well, on the timeline the ones that you're 
or on that timeline the one the parameters you have the object that you're selected on that's it so yeah this this timeline itself only shows me this particular object if i had made other keyframes at the same time here so if i'd have changed the color on this keyframe and selected that and pressed delete then yes i would have deleted my move keyframes as well um but that's why this is okay as a useful as a timeline preview and i will get into the timeline in a second Cool. Um, so Adonis was saying, hey, Matt and Ellie, can you show how to modify the anchor point axis in C4D using two methods? The first one using the axis tool and the other one using the geometry axis node operator inside the asset browser. It's really handy. No, because I have no idea how to use it. <laughs> so <laughs> no, no that, that, that's a simple one. I don't do nodes. So I can only show how to do the, move the object access the way I've done already, which is using the object access tool. Cool. Yeah, those were the questions for now. OK. Um, so let's have a look. Oh, why did I do that? Let's have a look at the timeline, um, which is a far easier thing to work with than that. So actually, I'm going to go back to this and I'm going to undo before I deleted those keyframes because it will highlight my point or your point, whoever it was, um, about accidentally deleting keyframes that were to do with other things. So this little button here, one of our new hot corners, brings up the timeline. Hooray! Um, quite possibly one of the most useful things um, that we have. And it allows you to see a much more in-depth version of the keyframes that you were or I was using. On the left hand side, we have the summary. This says there is a keyframe of something here. It lets you know that it goes all the way down. The cube, then if I use the little plus sign, shows that I have several things keyframed, funnily enough, size and position. And the material lets me know that I have my color channel select um, keyframe from each of these individual values. Now, effectively, you're quite right. If my little timeline down here, if I select these keyframes, it is selecting technically all of them. Well, that would be nice if that did the same thing. And if I delete those, I've deleted all of my keyframes underneath, including the move ones, which were here, which I don't want to delete. If I wanted to delete all of my material ones, then I could select my material or at least maybe these some in the middle. I could select those here and press delete. So I still have my start ones and my finish ones um, to move in between, which is really useful. The timeline also allows you to select and move keyframes really easily. So I can just draw a box around them, highlight them and then move them around. I can also select multiple groups of keyframes and then I can shift them all backwards and forwards using this as well so I can move them around to different points in my timeline. I can also use this little edge and I can scale them up or scale them down so if I wanted the whole thing to be longer or slower or faster or whatever then I can do that and now because I've got this little shorter group I can move my group to the middle of my animation which now when I press play means that it will stay still for a bit then jump over change color and stop again. Whee! minutes of fun here having making cubes change color and jump around so the timeline is like well as you've discovered trying to do complicated animations on that would be nigh on impossible okay um because it also only shows you what you have selected if i deselect my cube dunk, i still have a keyframe and why do i have a keyframe there what's that is it because I've got the material selected? There, was a, there we go. Yeah, I still have my material selected. Um, so it was showing me a keyframe. So I've got rid of that, got rid of the selection. I now have no keyframes in there whatsoever. If I select my cube again, I have keyframes. OK, um, and it's useful for like a quick preview to remind yourself where stuff is. But any actual animation you want to be working on changing and adapting keyframes, you want to use the timeline button here. OK, any questions on that? Um, not at the moment. 
Excellent. OK, so let's have a look at how things move from one side to another. If I go back to my super duper easy keyframe here, I'm just going to delete the one in the middle. I have a cube and this cube goes from one side to the other. Oh, I've even got size in there still. Let's get rid of scale. Position and vector. So I've just got my position. So I've just deleted stuff. So as you can see, I can also delete tracks straight out of here if I don't want them anymore. And I've even got position and I've got X, Y and Z. And as this is only moving on the X axis, I'm actually going to delete Z and Y. This is useful because it stops your Cinema 4D file getting unwieldy large because you don't have all of the animation keyframe data that you don't need. Matt, can I, um, one, one quick thing. Um, yes. Could you show how to get up the timeline if you are not in 25? Um, in th well, I can talk you through it, but I can't tell you because it's the option is no longer there. Is it not under Windows? Um, uh, technically, but I would have just changed. Well, I suppose that is one way of doing it. Yeah, I would have changed the layout. Oh. Um, so if you are not on 25 and you are on S24 or before, you can go to the top right hand corner and switch your layout to the animate layout, which would automatically bring up an animating layout and get rid of a few windows that you don't need. Or equally, you could go to window and go to timeline. Uh, there's two. We're about to go to the dope sheet one, so don't worry about that. But it is, in fact, the same window. So you can click that and it'll pop it out. And actually, if you have a second monitor, if you're lucky enough to have a second monitor, then you could, in fact, put your timeline on a completely different window to ensure that your Cinema 4D viewport stays in a much larger area. Um, that is another way of working. But for me, I'm going to press the dot button and have my little timeline pop up instead. Thanks. That's right. Now, as we've already noted, my cube moves from one side to the other by starting slowly, speeding up and then slowing down. This is known as its interpolation. Um, it, how it gets from one side of this one frame to another can be changed by its interpolation. Now, thankfully, the computer calculates most of that for us. Um, that's doing the, the in-betweens, the tweening for us. Um, but the interpolation, how it gets there, is, is actually denoted by a graph. Now, this graph, we can actually see if I do the final drop down here. And it's all well and good if I've only got one thing. That's not too bad. Um, but if I've got lots of them, it's very confusing. So you make sure you only have one selected. But there's actually another view here. So my timeline pop up has this little window. And the first one is switch to dope sheet, which is what you're on at the moment. And the second one is switch to F curve. F curve, function, curve, curve, graph. They're called entirely different things in every animation program. They are, however, exactly the same thing in every animation program. Um, so if I'm going to select that, you can see that I now have a lovely curve that operates from one side of the screen to the other. Um, and to make life easy to be able to see it, I'm going to... Where is that button gone? Where is my frame keyframe button gone? As you, of course, remember, lots has changed in R25. So trying to frame my keyframes would be really helpful round about now. If anyone happens to know where they've moved it, um, let me know. I actually can't find it. What's the, what's that? The frame keyframe button. So if I've got my keyframes out like that, there used to be a really useful button that you could press that says frame my keyframes, frame all. There it is. Accessible in the window. Or is it that? Is it that? No. Hmm. OK, that's going to throw me. Um, frame all. So what this does is it shows you the graph, which is the curve, which is the movement between 
the cube from one side of the screen to the other. It is a something time graph. And I say something because it is a number. And that value, that number denotes to maybe its size, maybe its height, maybe its hue saturation value or something like that. Um, but it's always a number. Um, and the rest, of course, the line across the top is time. That is the frame that you are on. Now you can see that it doesn't move very far at all in all of these, hence they're starting off slowly. It's more of a straight line in the middle, hence it's got a constant speed, and then it slows down, hence it not moving very far between each one of these individual ones. Now, what if I wanted to change it? So let's select my keyframe. Um, hello, there we go. Uh, and I should be able to something odd with my cinema is it happening i'm having... stumped what's... what is going on what is... i can't select my keyframes and i can't uh, let's turn that off <laughs> don't forget to toggle the tool that i turned on accidentally thinking it was something else Another anyway, deliberate mistake. Another, that yeah, that was doing. it. Right. Don't leave the active region tool on because it stops you being able to search keyframes. There we go. So, yay. selecting your timeline, you can see I've now got a tangent handle that I can adjust and that will allow me to adjust my curve. What if I wanted it to go a constant speed? My constant speed would be this. We have, thankfully, up here some preset um interpolations for you so pressing the first one which is linear which is a straight line allows me to press play and it will now be a constant speed going from beginning to end it just simply won't change um which is fine if that's the effect that you want to go for the step one is very interesting because of where my keyframe is it doesn't stay there for very long so let me just bring that over here and it will go bloop, bloop. so if you want something to suddenly appear somewhere or act like stop motion animation, then step animation is uh, step interpolation is what you need. The previous one was spline. I need to select the first keyframe first and turn it to spline. And there we go. I have spline interpolation, which shows that I can adjust my keyframes. And it's like a normal object. So I've um, like a line or a path. I've got tangent handles that I can use and I can adjust. So I can get this curvature so it starts off fast and then slows right down, or I can, you know, like really wobble it round and make some strange things occur. Whoop! You know, you can see because it's hardly moving across any of these particular frames, and then it then it goes across. So that is one of the ways of adjusting the interpolation. You can use these presets, or you can um, adjust your curve manually. Okay, any questions on that? Um, just having a quick look. No, it doesn't look like it. No, doesn't look like it. Awesome, okay. I still can't believe I can't find how to frame the keyframes. I'm not gonna lie, that's thrown me. Am I being blind? Delete unused tracks, user mode, clean tracks, remove redundant keys. That's helpful. Um, that pops it out. Undocks path bar filter. Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna look into that. Okay, so if we don't need to do anything more on F curves and the oh, timeline. Actually, one quick thing, and I was wondering, um, could you show for anyone who's like an After Effects user, how you could um, show the velocity graph in the F curve? So if you go to the F curve um, tab in your timeline, I think there's a show velocity option. Um, and so this might be a bit more recognizable to uh, After Effects users. Who are you and then I'm assuming 
in that way. When you adjust this, it will adjust your velocity. You can see that the different changes. You can't adjust the velocity on its own because it's the keyframe you need to adjust to manipulate the velocity. Cool, thanks. And Rick was saying, could you just press H to frame all when you were referring to framing? Um... Yeah, but there was there was always a handy because in, in theory, I can also, if I create another keyframe there, I can select those two and I should be able to use the same keyframes as I can on the other one, which is S to selected, H for frame all. But there should be buttons um, because unless you know the keyframes, uh, sorry, unless you know the shortcuts, you don't know to press the buttons. Anyway. True. Uh, sorry, one quick question just popped in. Um, how would you add a new keyframe along uh, the curve? Ah, exactly like I just did. Command or control click on the curve. Cool, thanks. Wee. Boing. Right. If that's that then, shall we start our meandering into dynamics? Yes, I think that would be cool. I like dynamics. Dynamics are fun. Me too. Um, so, with dynamics, what we're going to do really quickly we need to set up a scene in order to have dynamics um and i'm going to create a floor dunk there we go i have a floor and then i need to find an object that will be dynamic so i'm going to create a cube there is a cube hello cube um i'm gonna make that a bit Ooh, there we go bring that back out again now what I'm going to do with my cube, I'm going to go to objects, tags, sorry. And then I'm going to go to simulation tags and I'm going to give it a rigid body tag, meaning that this will have a solid shell. OK, so that's that. That now has rigid body. And if I press play, whee, it falls forever and it falls through the floor until the animation repeats and it keeps going. Why did it fall through the floor? Because the floor is not yet dynamic. So it does not know that it is supposed to react with other things as yet. So we need to go to my tags and then go to simulation. And I need to add a collider body. Now, a collider body is a dynamics body tag that doesn't allow it to fall, but allows it to have a solid surface. So now if I press play, blink, I have a cube that sits on the floor. OK, and that very, very quickly is dynamics. Um, there's a neat trick to show you, so I'm just going to select these two tags that I've created and press delete. If I select my cube and my floor at the same time, and I right click on my cube, and I go to simulation tags, rigid body, it will add the floor tag, sorry, it will add the rigid the collider body, what's with my words today, it will add the collider body to the floor, saving you having to do that. Now, please note, it will only do that to the floor object. If I created a plane instead and I did that, it would create a, a rigid body tag on both the cube and the plane and they'd both fall down to nothing. It only works on the floor. So now if I press play, bloop, there is my cube. And I can create a sphere as well if I want to. So let's create a sphere. Let's move the sphere up and to show that things are really easy i'm going to select my rigid body and i'm going to hold down control on my keyboard and click and drag and i'm going to create a copy so now i have a dynamic sphere and a dynamic cube and now i press play and that go doom, doom. Boom, boom. okay and it's it's really simple to do that now the sphere and the cube actually to be honest all of these things have information in them that allow me to control how they interact with each other and this is done under the collision tab. Now, at the moment, they've got very little bounce and a lot of friction, so they stay very put. However, let's whack up the bounce to 50% and let's see how it plays differently. Okay, we've got a little bit of a bounce there. Let's change that to 100% and see how it does it now. Okay, still a bit more. Right, as it's bouncing on the floor, let's give sorry, on the cube, we'll give the cube some bounce as well. And that's how stuff interacts with that. 
And now if we go to the floor, the cube just sits down and doesn't, it just plonks because of the bounce that this gives to other objects. So if I make that 50%, the cube now bounces and it, ooh, it's done something very strange with the sphere. So let's make that super bouncy. Whee! Okay, hours of fun here with all of these things bouncing around and moving around and going crazy. Um, and insane dynamics tags. Um, just having stuff fly around everywhere. Any questions on dynamics so far? Nothing yet. I mean, they may come in as we continue. I'm just trying to think. There's not really much else to explain about dynamics, really, is there, other than those two? Um, At least that you're not going to sort of cover in a minute. You're very true. Um, you could have you could show triggering on collision. So I'm not going to be going through that. That's a good point. Let's do that. Cool. That's quite a cool thing to show. Yeah. Okay. I like doing this. So let's create myself a scene again. Let's create the floor and let's create some dynamic. Can I go through Voronoi? Am I allowed to go through Voronoi fracture? Yeah. Yay. We can explain it in detail so next week. <laughs> Oh yeah, we are, aren't we? Oh. Yeah, but we can yeah, still show it. We just don't worry it's about dynamic. going through. This is dynamics. This isn't the Voronoi. So let's create something fun. There's a sphere. Super fun. And I have a sphere in bits. And if I go to my Voronoi and I'm going to select my floor and right click on my Voronoi, and I'm going to go to simulations and rigid body just because it gives me the two tags. If I now press play, my sphere falls apart. Smashing! Which is really cool. But what if I didn't want it to do that at the beginning? So at the moment, you can see the moment I press play, this falls apart and smashes to bits. What if I didn't want it to do it? So with the dynamics tag on my Voronoi selected, I'm going to change. Um, this from uh, immediate to on collision. So in the dynamics tag, I've got dynamics set to on, which means it will be dynamic from the moment that something starts. And the trigger means immediately I will start straight away. However, if I change that to on collision and press play, nothing happens. Okay, because funnily enough, it's waiting for some form of collision. So let's create something for it to collide with. And this can be a cube. Now, if I press play and I move my cube, nothing happens. This is because the cube is not yet dynamic. We need to tell Cinema 4D this cube is dynamic. So funnily enough, I'm going to go to my cube. I'm going to go to my tags, simulation, collider. See where we're going here, collider, collision. So if I press play again, nothing happens. The cube stays where it is. Um, but if I move my cube, whee, I can actually, <laughs> I can spend hours like just grabbing this as a smash, or as like whee, and like bashing things around and playing pool with them, or you know smashing them. Uh, there's there's hours of fun here as well, like this road sweeping, um, and that's the sort of thing that you can do really easily. Now, what if I wanted to do that, but I didn't want to see the cube? I will hide my cube from camera and render but the cube is still being created so if i press play and i move my cube it still acts as a collider which means i can control when i want these things to happen to make it look like stuff is like smashing apart and you can see the difference between like they're just lightly tapping it and it will fall down or hitting it like from one end of the screen to the other Whee! and it will go absolutely crazy so you can, of course, keyframe this animation. So let's keyframe my cube. And I'm going to be efficient. And I'm only going to keyframe my X there. And then at one second, I want it to be smack bang where the sphere is. And I'm going to keyframe it again. And let's see what happens. Smoosh. There we go. And from all intents and purposes, the cube just randomly gets hit from the side and blows up and blows everywhere. 
And that's a little bit of useful fun dynamics using colliders, hiding objects from view, um, but still keeping them generated so that you can use them as a collider. Cool, thanks. We've had a bunch of questions in now, which is uh, really cool. So Logan was kind of questioning um, inside of the um, like the dynamics tag, linear dampening and rotational dampening. And um, let's have a look. <laughs> so basically, the idea is it's the kind of artificial removal of um, the energy. So, for example, if you so rotational dampening, I'm um, sorry, angular dampening is basically the ro dampening of the rotation. So if you had a sphere spinning and you up your angular dampening, it would eventually roll to a stop. And linear is the same thing, but linear is positional um, movement. So it will kind of, it, for example, if you had like a dynamic simulation and everything's kind of like getting to the end and it's all kind of still wriggling around, um, you can increase the dampening and it will basically calm everything down. That's kind of what cool. it does. Thank you very much. Um, so Joe was wondering about, um, can you change the gravity um, and the mass? Um, yes. Can. Yes, um, and there's a couple of different ways of doing it. So you can look at the mass of the objects that's being created and you can choose different densities, different custom centers of the objects that are being created. The gravity by default is set per the project. So if you do control D, whether you are Windows or Mac, and then you go to the dynamics tab, you can control the effectiveness that the strength of the gravity at the moment it's 1000 centimeters i i don't know if that's just an arbitrary number or if that actually relates to some form of gravitational pascals isn't it is the unit of gravity i think um or am i wrong newtons probably newtons forgotten um but okay. you can <laughs> change that sorry no, I, I know where to change it in Cinema 4D. I <laughs> uh, don't know anything else about it. <laughs> yeah, you can see that if I make that a lot lower, these things float around. Um, whereas if I, let's add two zeros to that, plop. You know. <laughs> so we've got smashing something on Earth. Yay. Smashing something on the moon. Whee! Smashing something on Jupiter. <laughs> complete flap right yeah so yes you can change the the gravitational force and that is per project so that will only save for this project settings cool thanks um yes yeah, so we had another about gravity um this is a good one what happens to keyframes when adding dynamic parameters um they can be kind of used in conjunction but it depends what you're trying to do um you can't yeah you can't keyframe stuff and work together so if i can i if i keyframe that here no i can only keyframe it starting because it's a dynamic thing so i can't control anything else because it's keyframes are over it's dynamics are overwriting so all i can do is choose a keyframe for where it begins but i now can't control this because the dynamics are going no nah. the flip side of that is if it was a so when you were showing about the collision of something yeah if the object that you're using as a collider um you could actually keyframe that into something so if it's got yeah, a collider that, body that is what we've you got. could yeah you could keyframe it but yeah yeah, that's yeah, that's what we've got here. So the the yeah. dynamic is the dynamic for the cube. If we look, um, the dynamics trigger is immediate because it becomes dynamic as a collider immediately, but its actual dynamic state is off. Whereas if we look at the Voronoi, its dynamic state is on, but its trigger will only occur on collision. So the collision with another dynamic object, which this is because it's got a tag, but dynamic off here means that it will ignore gravity and mass and things like that. Cool. And I guess we don't have to show it, but the opposite side of that 
can be if you have a dynamic simulation, you could bake it as an alembic and therefore it turns that dynamic simulation into keyframes. Yes. Now that kind of is cool. a good thing to look at. So if I press play of my simulation, we smash. OK, I'm going to just, just forget it. Um, but if I if you look what I'm doing now, I'm going backwards and it's not like magicking together even if i go back to like just before it smashed it still doesn't do anything if i go back to the beginning whoop, it would do that and then if i scroll forward and go backwards oh smash and every time i go forward even though i'm going to the same bit the simulation is calculating because cinema 4d is calculating this simulation this is something that it means cinema 4d is trying to figure out how to simulate each of these individual components hitting together hitting the floor hitting the thing where is it bouncing what is it doing what is gravity where is it yada 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 for each frame um and it doesn't it's calculating it every time so as a simulation it can't reverse the simulation it doesn't know how so as Elias said we can do several things we can bake as an alembic which will turn it to keyframes if we want to but we can also create a cache, which is kind of the same, but a hidden version. So this is going to be my first step, which is I'm going to bake all. And this bakes a dynamic simulation, which means I can scrub through and I can scroll backwards instantly in my file. This does not give me any keyframes, so I can't manually edit or adjust anything. This is just a quick way of Cinema 4D no longer having to calculate what each one of these is done, doing because it's done it once and it now understands they have path tra trajectories, rotational values and whatever and where they hit and where they stop. But that's all hidden in the back. So if I want to do what Elias then said, I will then select my Voronoi and I will go to object, bake as a Lembic. I can bake as a Lembic and delete and that will remove my original one which is all very well and good if you know you definitely don't need it but if you're going to think oh i might tweak that in a minute i want that to be less gravity you'll need to rebake it and remodel it so i'm just going to bake as a lembic which will create a copy in the file it says hey where do you want to put this um so i'm just going to put it on my desktop hold on what did i say open as a bake as a lembic desktop just put it there that's fine and it will create a fake version so if i'm going to hide my voronoi fracture one i now have each of these individual elements that i can look at and i can play with them if necessary because um, i can make the that editable can't i i think That's, that's not that baking it as keyframes. It's baked as a lembic, but it's not giving me the keyframes. Um, do you have to go into the timeline and bake? The yes, um, that's the other way. Jar. So I've got the Voronoi. Bring up my timeline. And then I can find where they've put it. Bake objects. <laughs> All parameters, click OK, and I should get, look at all my keyframes. So many keyframes, um, but that's only for the single one that I've done. If I'd have selected all of them, I could have done it or the null. But I can actually now take one of those and <laughs> move the keyframe of my thing, which now completely goes wrong. Well, it doesn't. That's really strange. What have I got selected? Cool, because then you can trigger this kind of animation with MoGraph. But that's yeah, a, and you can cheat day. it. <laughs> Absolutely. Anything else on dynamics then before I hand over to you? <laughs> Rick says, how do I make this animation available as an NFT and make a million dollars? Um, as long as you share it with us, you can you can have it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Um, one quick one. So Martin is saying, can you explain how to keep the objects from my emitter from going through my collider plane, it only catches about half of the rigid bodies. So emitting spheres, rigid body on those, plane collider body, and some of the spheres are dropping through the plane is what I am picturing right now. Yeah. 
Um, you might need to increase the number of segments on whatever it is that they are going down onto because it can be related to the number of points that are on the objects. Um, it basically tries to figure out if there's a point here and a point here, it won't let it go through. If it's too close to a point, it won't, it will stop it from working. Um, so you might need to adjust and figure out some settings that way, I would have thought, if things are disappearing. Um, or change... Is it steps per steps per frame? Steps per frame would be one of them. Steps, is that just, the, yeah, that's the right one, isn't it? Yeah, also just check whether or not uh, your dynamics collision shape is automatic or static mesh or something that you can actually configure um, would be something I would look at as well. And the step frames frames per step is under the project files isn't it uh yeah so command d to get to um project settings and then under dynamics there's then is it an expert tab yeah and you can change the steps per frame so it basically that means it's thinking the number of frames that you have it will work out the correct kind of collision data and the, the more steps per frame you have the more it has to think about the simulation so it may be a bit laggier and slower yeah, but in theory slower. it should be more accurate yeah mess with those bottom three yeah but not too much no. like if you're going to mess like mess with them up them a bit like one or two don't add zeros to them because you <laughs> That's normally my go-to. <laughs> Add a zero to it. Yeah. Uh, let's see what happens. Cool, yeah. So that's um, a couple of different ways to solve that. Okay. Cool. I think that is all of the questions for now. I think. Yeah. I should do the pop out and see what it says. Um. Can you use simulation and collision to an object that's been modelled? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and as long as it exists inside of Cinema 4D as a polygonal object, you can do it. Cool. Okay. Right. I will throw the screen at you. Oh, cool. There you go. It's all, right. all yours. Uh, show my screen. Cool. Can you see my screen? Also, Matt, um, earlier there was a technical question inside the chat. Um, okay. I haven't got to. So, if you if you have time, please and thank. Okay, I will have a nose. Cool. Um, right. So, hey everyone, uh, let's get into creating a a bit of like a dynamic scene. And so, I think a couple of weeks ago, someone mentioned about creating like inflating text or balloon text, and I thought, why not mix? all of this together and create a fun kind of inflating dynamic text simulation. And so this is this is what we're gonna go for, something um, really nice and simple like this. And I'm just gonna press play. So hopefully the playback was okay for everyone to see. I'm just gonna kind of keep going through it so everyone can kind of catch it. So basically what's happening is we have our sort of skinny looking C4D text. And then we have a linear field coming down and it triggers this kind of um, balloon inflating effect. And then as it kind of inflates, we also have dynamics kicking in. And so it's gonna like bounce off each other. It's gonna bounce off our floor and it just creates this kind of like fun looking animation. So we're gonna get into making this. And then if we have some time, cause I don't know how long this will take, we might sort of have a look at um, the emitter, which has been mentioned and how we can use that with dynamics to create sort of this filling up uh, letter effect. So yeah, let's get, let's get into it. Right, and as always, you know, let Matt know your questions. He can, um, he can stop me and we can answer those and do them live, um, that's, that's, that's the fun bit. Cool, right, so first thing first, I'm just gonna create my scene and it is super simple. It is just a plane, which is gonna be my kind of floor, which is gonna be my collision. And then I'm also going to grab some text. 
So I'm just going to come in and grab some normal text here. And so you guys can grab, you know, whatever text you want and it can say whatever you want. And I'm going to have it saying um, C4D because it looks it looks kind of cool when we inflate those uh, letters. Cool. Right. So we have our C4D text and I'm just going to align it to the middle because I like my axis to be in the center of my text. That is just a personal preference. So let me just move this out of the way. Cool. So what sort of settings in here do we want to change? So the main thing we want to change is we want to find a font that is going to um, kind of help us when we are creating this inflated balloon kind of style. And for that, we want to find like a nice rounded font. And for me, I actually have one already that's called um, Nanito. And if I select that, inside of my kind of options i then have a black which is like a really bold option and we can see here that we have this really nice kind of smooth rounded um, font and so this is this is a nice starting position and then when we add things like um like a nice bevel and we add some displacement it all kind of everything works together to help create this nice looking balloon font so depth wise i'm just going to up this slightly so default on 20 i'm actually going to up it just to 30 and then the only other thing i want to do is i actually want it to be on the um x y uh plane so i'm actually just going to rotate this 90 degrees so i'm gonna hit my r key or we could come over to our toolbar on the left and then i'm going to grab my red rotation band and i'm just going to click it and then i'm going to hold my shift key and then i'm going to i've got both held down and i'm just going to move it and this is going to help me move in um like increments of five uh, degrees and i'm going to let them both go and now we've we've kind of rotated um minus 90 degrees and the only other thing i need to do because at the moment it's kind of underneath my plane i need to just pull it up so we can do that in a variety of different ways so I can hit my E key for my shortcut and move it up like that. Or we can just come into our text. And because I know my depth is 30 centimeters in my coordinates of my C4D text, I can move it up on the Y position by 30 centimeters. And so Y is like our up and down. And so we know that we can just type in 30 and it's going to push you up by 30 centimeters, which is cool. We're going to have to do this again when we add a bevel, um, but for now, at least we can see it and we kind of know what we're working with. Right, so the next step is to add um, some nice rounding. So at the moment, we've got this like really sharp edge and we've got this really kind of like flat cap on top. And so what we can do inside of our text, we can actually come into this caps section. And we looked, um, we looked at these in one of the previous weeks. I'm not gonna spend too much time going through them but we're actually gonna add a bevel. And so our bevel shape, we're gonna keep to round because that's gonna be the perfect one for us. And then we're just gonna up our size just until kind of, we don't want it to like start to intersect. So maybe, so 10 centimeters seems to work fine, but we've actually got, if we come in here, we actually have this weird kind of like effect happening. And if we switch on our lines, basically what's happening is we have a bevel of 10 centimeters, but we only have three segments or three subdivisions trying to create this nice, smooth, rounded effect. And that just isn't enough. So we need to up our segments, which is our subdivisions. So if we just sort of increase this, maybe nine, like we don't want to go we don't want to kind of like go too crazy because eventually we'll drop this into a subdivision surface, which will kind of subdivide everything. So we don't, we know we don't need to go like overkill just enough to get some nice smooth in. And if you switch on our shading, we've pretty much fixed that whole issue from happening, which is cool. Cool. So we have the start of our um, balloon text. And I'm not going to worry about changing anything else now, but we will eventually come back into our text and make some changes. So now what we want to do is we want to create this um, inflating effect. And 
there's a couple of different ways to do it. We can do it using soft flow dynamics and increase the pressure amount. But for me, I'm gonna keep it simple and I'm gonna use a deformer. So deformers is something we learned about in week one when we looked at primitives and we looked at like bend deformer and we looked at like the taper to change our kind of primitive shapes. And we can actually use what's called a displacement deformer, if I can find it in here. So we looked in this, so this menu here, or if you're on 24, it'll be kind of up here somewhere. So if we just click and hold, we can see, you know, we've already looked at these different deformers and we had a little look at the twist as well. All the way down here, we have something that's called a displacer. So we know when we use deformers, we need to kind of fix our hierarchy. And that's going to basically tell Cinema 4D that we're like, OK, cool. We want to use this deformer on this particular object. And so the deformer has to be what we call a child. And so if I click and hold my displacer, and because I want it to be kind of working with my um, C4D text, I'm going to just hover over the text. And now my arrow has gone from kind of pointing left to pointing down. And if I let go, it's now a child of our text. However, nothing's happened. So if I switch it on and off or deactivate it and activate it, Nothing's actually happening, even though we've got like some strength and some height values. And that's because the way the displacer works is, is we have to actually put a what's called a shader inside of the displacer. And so to give like a visual example of how the shader works, I'm just going to drop this down and I'm going to grab a gradient. And the gradient is going to give us a kind of a black to white gradient. And so what we can see here is if I switch this off and on, we can see that everything that is 100% black isn't being affected by our displacement height. And everything that is 100% white is being affected. And everything in the middle is sort of like a um, gray gradient. Uh, and that's been affected between a value of zero and a value of 10 centimeters. So this is the best way of seeing exactly kind of how these grayscale um, shader maps work with a displacer. And knowing this information, we now know, okay, cool. So we want this displacer to have a all over effect on my text. I want it to be inflated everywhere. And so I know, therefore I want everything to be, um, the shader to be 100% white. So I can just select color and then we get a 100% white value. And now everything is kind of being increased by this height of 10 centimeters. So now we switch it off and switch it on. We can see that we're getting this like cool inflating effect. But let me come back into my shading and lines because we have some strange things happening. And the thing is, when we use a displacer or um, kind of we're looking at deforming uh, things, we have to make sure we have enough subdivisions and segments to warrant any kind of deformation that's happening. And so the same as like in week one, if you were there, when we had our cube and we tried to twist it, if we didn't up our segments, um, it all just kind of got a little bit messed up because we can't deform an individual polygon. And so what we need to do, we actually need to fix some of these um, subdivisions inside of here. And we can do that inside of our text. So let's have a look at what we're going to change. So the first thing I'm going to change is I'm actually going to look at this kind of this top cap here or this front cap, which is just um, one individual polygon. So we need to we need to up that. We need to have a couple of um, subdivisions on that. So inside of my text and inside of my caps, I can come all the way down and I have a caps type, which at the moment is set to Engon. If I drop this down, we have regular grid as an option. If I select that, we can then drop this down again. And then we have a size and something that's called quad dominant. And we want to work with quads um, for this. So I'm actually just going to enable that. And now everything's going to slightly change. And now what I can do, I can reduce my um, size 
to create a kind of more of an all over um, subdivided cap. So if I go to maybe something like five, we can see that we have a lot more subdivisions. You know what, I might even go to six because you know, as we said, we're gonna be dropping it into a subdivision anyway. So it should be, um, should be all good. A couple of other ways of adding some subdivisions because um, we're gonna wanna do all three of these kind of um, changes is we have, if we come into here, this is probably where we can see it best. Down in the object tab, we have something called intermediate points. And by default, it's set to adaptive. And what that means is on the flatter areas of my letters, we can see that we don't have as much um, subdivisions versus the kind of more rounded areas. And basically what it's doing, it's adapting the amount of points and therefore the amount of subdivisions to the areas that need it. And this is really great for not kind of over like doing like overkill, but we want to have more of a um, uniform um, amount of subdivisions. So we're going to come in and we're going to go to subdivided. And now we can see we have a load more. And then we can just uh, adjust our maximum length to something like not 90. We can adjust our angle, sorry, to 90 centimeters. Uh, My screen has frozen. <laughs> oh, are there any questions while it, this <laughs> deals with itself? Hello, right, sorry. <laughs> sorry, my Cinema 4D has... Um... That's all right, it wouldn't okay. accept my um, unclicking. A little bit of a melt. Um... I think it's gonna crash. No, no questions as such at the moment. Okay, I might, oh, what am I gonna wanna do? Okay, I'm not gonna wait. I'm gonna force quit. And then I'm going to bring it back. So yeah, I think I accidentally dropped my angle to something like 0 0.01 and then tried to quickly undo and then Oops. it didn't, <laughs> yeah, so obviously didn't. Did you kill it? Didn't look at it right, okay. Um, let me just quickly inflate text. Right, for the sake of this, I'm gonna grab these, take these off, take that off, and we should kind of be back to where we were. And here's one we made earlier. And here's one, I made. this is why I'm glad I saved this project. Okay, so the only, um, um, diff oh, yeah. I do have a question. Can okay. you inflate the side of the letters where the extrusion depth is? Round the side like rounding bevel. I don't quite understand. Um, or you could animate the bevel. Mm. So inside of the text and inside of the caps, you could actually, um, anything that has this little diamond is a little keyframe button. So you could animate that um, particular thing. If it's more the kind of the, the bevel that you want to have um, inflate, you could animate that. Whereas the displacer is going to do like an all over sort of increase. Cool, thank you. Cool, right, so I just wanna get back to sort of where we were. So back in the object tab, we changed intermediate points to subdivided, our angle was at 90 and at maximum length, tip, do not accidentally put 0 0.01 because it might crash. Um, cool, so let me put that on zero because that's what that should be as well. And the only other thing we increased here is our subdivisions on our depths which we just put to a value of six. So normally it looks like this, and we've just upped that to six. Okay, cool. So I'm pretty sure we are back to where we were. Let me just switch off my dynamics because we're gonna add that. Cool, 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 cool. Right, so 
yeah everything is back to how it was the height is actually on seven centimeters now instead of 10 and the reason for that is if we put it on 10 we have this kind of um this overlapping happening which isn't something uh, that we want so we just need to make sure um when we're doing this effect that we don't just increase our height amount to any old number because then when you render it's going to look a little bit a um, little bit funky so seven is just kind of um just to the point where everything's touching and so we get that nice kind of balloon crease cool right so now what we want to set up is we want to set up a way of triggering um this inflating um from happening so at the moment it's it's having like an all over effect but we want it to to kind of go from like skinny to inflated and the way that we do that is using something called fields and we're not going to worry about going through fields um today um we're just going to have a little brief look for the purposes of this animation um but fields is something extremely powerful inside of Cinema 4D and it allows us to um, control where and how certain effects happen. So it can be used across the board. So next week we're going to be looking at it inside of MoGraph and in particular how we can kind of um, trigger certain effectors um, and have certain effects happening in some areas and not in others by using um, like a field fall off. So yeah, I just want like, to don't worry that we're not going in too much detail about it because next week definitely it'll be um, quite a big topic when it comes to MoGraph. So inside of my displacer or inside of any deformer, we have this fields tab and then we have our fields menu. Um, all we're going to do is we're going to come over to the create new field object and I can just click and it's going to give me a linear field. But in case um, yours isn't a linear field, all you have to do is click and hold. And then you get all these field objects, which are sort of like a fall off shape. And I'm going to grab a linear field. I'm going to grab that. And a couple of things have happened. So first of all, we now have this kind of bounding box in the middle of our scene. And we also have our effect happening to the right hand side of our linear field um, bounding box. And so if I move this along, we can kind of see exactly what this field is doing. Everything to the left um, isn't being affected or our displacer is having no effect to everything to the left hand side of our linear field. And everything to, everything to the right hand side of our linear field is being 100% affected by our displacer. And then everything in the middle, again, is our lovely gradient. This is great, this is really cool. But the thing is, we don't want a left to right um, effect. We want this to kind of come from top to bottom and then it's going to happen really quickly and it's all going to inflate uh, and then our dynamics going to kick in. So the way that we can change this um, and go from top to bottom, we just need to change the direction of our field. And because we know our up and down is our Y axis, we just want to change it to one of our Y directions. So if I grab my linear field, and what you've also probably noticed is it becomes an automatic child of the displacer when we created it. So we didn't have to do that bit ourselves. So inside of my linear field, we have a direction at the moment because uh, it's kind of going um, along the X axis. We want to change it to um, positive Y. So if we do that, now as I lift my linear field up and then we pull it down, we're having the effect happen um, from top to bottom. The only other thing I'm going to do is I don't need it to be 100 centimeters. That's, that's way too big. So if we come into here, let's maybe make it like 25. And now we can just sort of pull it down and then we have this effect. Cool. So now let's create some keyframes. So Matt has shown us over kind of like the, the first hour how we can set up some of our own keyframes. And this entire animation is only going to be using two keyframes. That's it. So what we want to do, so we're going to start at frame zero. This is where our animation is going to begin. And I want my linear field to be just above 
just above everything. So I'm actually just going to zero out the x axis. And then maybe we'll start it on like 75. Cool. So what I need to do, I need to set a keyframe on my linear field position on just the y axis, because that's the only um, bit we're going to be changing the position of. So I'm going to set a keyframe. So I just hit that little diamond there and we can see it's now gone red and we can see we now have our little keyframe here on frame zero. And I want this effect to happen really quickly. So I want it to almost be like like that and it's inflated. So at frame five, I'm then going to say, OK, I want the um, the inflation and the displacer to 100 percent be affecting everything. So I'm just going to pull this down. And I just want to make sure that it's all the way through. And then I'm going to hit another keyframe. And now as we press play, so as we go back to the beginning, as you press play, we can see this happens super quick. Cool. So um, any questions on that before we get into adding um, any dy some dynamics? Not as yet, no. There's, there's been a few questions coming in or I'm having discussions with people, but nothing about what you're actually doing at this point. Oh, Although that there was a, a, an interesting idea that perhaps we could show a comparison between you using the displacer and you using soft bodies and the inflate and deflate to do it. Um, yeah. But uh, I was like, possibly not right now. <laughs> oh, no, but soon, to be fair, all we have to do now is add dynamics. And then once that's done, we could look at, yeah, um, doing a bit of soft body. Oh, OK. Just uh, just as in the inflation um, part, we won't go too much into soft body. Cause, OK. Yeah. Definitely don't set anything to 0 0.01 there. Uh, no, I'll, I'll stick to just the one crash for today. <laughs> <laughs> Cool, right, so um, quick recap. Um, we've created our floor, which was our plane. We created our text, which was our C4D, um, that we have, you know, we picked that nice round font. We then added our nice bevel, all that helps us, you know, create this nice balloon um, effect. We then uh, sorted out all of our subdivisions and then added our displacer with our 100% white color which was our kind of like big inflating thing. And then we added a linear field and animated it. And we have that now triggering this inflate effect from happening. And then just, you know, for the sake of things looking uh, nice, I'm going to add a subdivision surface, which was what we looked at in week two when we looked at modeling. And I'm just gonna drop my entire text display set and linear field setup inside. And so now, it should still be super fast. We now have, um, like, but if we kind of show our lines, a much more smooth and subdivided um, text object. And as we can see, it doesn't have an impact on the speed of our animation at all, which is nice. Okay, right. So now let's have dynamics kick in. So what we want to do is this kind of inflates. I thought it would be quite cool if they kind of like then interact with one another and bounce off one another kind of like um kind of like balloons so we need to set up um two different uh, dynamics tags our first one is going to be on our text and so on my text i'm just going to right click and under simulation tags we are going to come into uh rigid body i'm going to grab that and that's because I want this to kind of interact and collide with itself and also with the floor. And we want gravity to kind of like kick in and work with it. And so we're going to leave it as it is. We're not going to change any settings just yet, but we will eventually be changing them. So before I press play, I actually need to set up some collision on my plane. So I'm going to right click on my plane and under simulation tags, we're going to go to collider body. Cool, right, so let's go back and now let's play and see see how different this looks. Okay. So we can see our dynamics is kicking in. We can see our inflate is happening, but it's not looking that interesting yet. And there's a few things I wanna change. So the first thing I wanna change inside my text, inside my object, I'm actually gonna adjust my horizontal spacing because I want them to be as close as possible before they inflate. 
maybe we go minus eight. So this is going to help now. Um, so as they inflate, they're going to have more kind of pressure as they hit each other because they are now closer together. Um, let's find a cool angle, maybe something like that. Let's press play. Okay, cool. Yeah, so we're getting a bit more of like a distance now. But now we're going to adjust um, the settings that Matt showed us, so, you know, the bounce and the friction. And so by default, the rigid body tag has not a lot of bounce and quite a lot of friction. So we can see the default settings are five and 90. Let's basically swap these over. Let's maybe go like a bounce of 75 and a friction. Maybe we're not gonna go too crazy. Let's go like 15. We don't want it to be like looking like it's slipping off the plane. Let's come in and then let's press play. One thing I do notice that I that bothers me so much, um, when I go back to frame zero, sometimes the dynamic doesn't always go back to like its actual position, which is this. So sometimes I just go forward a keyframe and go back, which is a pain, but it gets us back to the beginning. Now let's press play. Cool, so we can see now the friction, we need to have maybe a little bit more. Cool, so we have created our balloon inflating text, which was uh, pretty much this one here. All I did was add um, two textures onto this one, but it's exactly the same setup. Excellent, that's cool. I've got an interesting question for you. Oh, oh God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, how would you make the animation start, say, at one end of the letter C and curve around the other side as a kind of right on effect that would look like someone is blowing up the balloon? Okay. Now, I have okay. an idea in my head, but I don't know how easy it would work. In theory, you should be able to, if I'm right. What's your thinking? I was going to use a spherical field. Okay. A spherical field. Why, what, no, you go. What were you going to do? Um, I, was gonna suggest, I was going to suggest a vertex map and using, you'd have to make the, you would have to make the text editable mm -hmm. so that we could get points. And then we would do a grow from, like, say, three different points on each individual letter oh, and then yeah. use that vertex map in the displacer so that it grew. OK, right. <laughs> Let's yeah. see. I know we like to do this stuff. OK, right. So, 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 so. I'm going to bin off a displacer for now and set up my vertex map first. Yeah. Um, should we just, I'm going to leave it like that. That should be fine. Yeah. Cool. Right. So I'm going to make my text editable. I'm going to hit my C key and I'm just going to connect, um, objects and delete. So now we have just our, now all of this is just empty nulls. So we can get rid of that. And now we have our solid, um, C4D text editable and the reason that we do this i mean oh god how, how much are we going into vertex maps they're so we could, we could talk for hours about them i know so when we set up vertex maps they have to be on um editable objects so we have so we can no longer have um our non-destructive text which is the only downside to vertex maps but they come with so many pros that it's worth it mm. cool right so the way that i'm going to set this up do you think i should do it from different areas or are we going to have it in a grow from one area i think you'll have to have it i don't know if it will vertex map from one letter to another so i think you would need to have three does if you have enough of a radius uh, so it, would, it, it will do it let's, let's do it let's just do it right okay. so points let's go points mode so let's say we're going to start from this bit as if it's kind of yeah, so being I'm going up on to end. basically just grab, I'm going to grab a single point. So this one little point here on my C4D, I basically come into points mode and I've grabbed this one. And the way that we can set up a vertex map is we can come into our um, select 
So with my point selected, and then we can go down to something that says set vertex weight. So if I set this, it's going to say, OK, what do you want to set the value of this point to be? And I'm going to set this value to be a um, weight of 100%. And so when we press OK, everything looks kind of different. Basically, what's happened is our one point is now yellow and everything else is red. And this is our vertex weight. And this is our vertex weight tag over here. So it's storing um, this weight information. Sorry, I'm just um, laughing because um, because at the moment, we obviously, we know that the vertex map is all on your screen in red. So your face is all like evil and red at this particular oh, no, point. Like, you're... <laughs> <laughs> Should I don't want to write this down? <laughs> on, let me let me do a little zoom yeah, out. That, that, it's a bit less imposing do i like it a little bit less scary now that's it yeah it was a very sort of like evil vertex map look going on <laughs> okay cool right so so we have this little yellow area and this is our vertex weight and it's going to start from here and what we can do inside of our vertex map tag oh it's changed we have the ability to use fields. And so what we can do, we can grow this effect by using a modifier field layer. Yep, and so it has changed and you're gonna need to go to the basic tab first and click use fields, otherwise it won't work. Changed. I discovered that the other day. Oh. Because um, otherwise it won't give you the freeze function that you had. Let me just do it properly then. <laughs> okay, there cool, right. So back in the basic tab, use fields. Yes, that is a little bit different, isn't it? Um, cool, and so automatically, actually, it's now added to the modifier layer that we need, which is super handy, which is our freeze. And the way that we can create a grow effect is by coming into our freeze and into our mode here, and we can select grow. And automatically, we can see that our little yellow area has become a bigger yellow area. And what it's doing, is it's looking for a point within a radius of 10 centimeters. And so what I'm gonna do, let me just come out of here, is repress play. So now what's happening is our Ooh. vertex weight has grown all the way over our C4D text. And so the thing is, this is, that's, I mean, it's pretty fast, but hey, we'll leave it, we'll leave it as this. So what you might find is if, it's not jumping to the next letter or number or whatever you have, up your radius, that's all you're gonna have to do. And if you want this to effect to happen slower, you can actually adjust the effect strength. So let's say we're like, look, this is a little bit too fast. We can change this, maybe like 50 centimeters, and then it all happens that little bit slower. Let's take this, let's leave it on 100. Okay, cool, right, so. Now what we want to do is we want to now create our inflation effect again. So we can get our displacer back and we can make it a child of our C4D uh, text. And then what we can do, we can actually use our vertex map inside of our fields menu. And then what's gonna happen is it's then going to grow this inflate effect. I might need to invert it. We'll see. So what I'm going to do is drag and drop this into here. And then as I press play, it is not working. Okay. That was a real anticlimax, wasn't it? <laughs> Why is that working? Mm -mm 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 -mm. Oh. Okay, cool. So it's super delayed. Right. Let me. Oh, okay. That. Um, we don't need to remap it then. Let me just up my frames. Maybe it's just me that's delayed. Why is it delayed though? It should be affecting straight away. There we go. 
should be. That's interesting. That's something to look at. But in theory, that's what we should do. That's what yes. would work. So this should should be a uh, basically it should be following this and inflating. Yeah. But it's obviously having a bit of an issue with it today. Hmm. Yeah, because it's actually kind of impacting from another place. That might be something to look at, but that in theory is is the way that I would attempt to get it to inflate from one end round the other. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I'm confused why that's not working, but yeah, that is the way that I would would normally do it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, cool. We don't have any questions still as yet. Um, okay. Which is nice. As I say, uh, thank you, Rick, for that one. Um, yeah. He said um, he laugh. Another thing you could also do is inside the Vertex app, um, you could use like a spherical field and animate the spherical field round. So let's say you wanted more control of how this growth happens. You could still use the freeze, but you could animate the spherical field and it would be effectively drawing. Um, let me find it, spherical field. Let me just shrink this down. And you could like draw it round. And if you had the, if you had the freeze having it grow, um it would it would grow from where you're drawing so if you wanted like um even more control basically you could uh, do it that way right so um so someone said about showing the way to do it with a uh, soft body mm. um yeah let's, oh let's it, here's an interesting question what dynamics would make them float away after inflating. Um, so in theory, after inflating, you could, well, you could actually put gravity in the scene, couldn't you, using one of the forces, and then you could cheat it and then lower the gravity. And so actually you're not making the objects float, you're reversing gravity. Um, yeah, and, and then you could yeah, animate that, yeah, the gravity. Yeah, so it all happens at the right time. That's probably the easiest way of doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you wouldn't it wouldn't be the gravity under the project settings. You would need to set that to zero and then you'd have to create a gravity object under the simulate menu. But that's another way of doing it. But we're about to see something else from Alex. Um, I was also thinking. So we have like custom initial velocity as well. Which you can then give the impression that something is fired up and you could animate that as well. So for example, okay. if we come in here, if we grab, I don't know, like a cube, and then we go to simulation, rigid body, uh, custom initial velocity, and then we'd want it to be, let's say it goes, um, I don't know, like 500 centimeters. You could do it like that. Or we can go crazy, 5,000 centimetres. <laughs> and you could fire it off that way. And you could keyframe that um, from happening. So this is cool for like, if you wanted something to be fired up and then land. So grab a plane, uh, simulation, collider. So if you want something to fire up, and then land, custom initial velocity is a way of doing that. So you could always do custom initial velocity and then have your gravity kind of cut out and then it would just uh, float away. Right, so uh, setting up inflation with soft body. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna stick to using one letter. What's a cool letter? Should we let, let's do the letter S. We like that one, don't we? And I'm just going to send that into the middle. Yes. And then... 
and maybe I'm going to do the same font as I did before have this nice rounding because all of this is going to just kind of um, help us when we look at inflating so minus 90 and then I'm going to bring it up by 30 definitely not that by 30 um right okay so um right into my caps I'm going to do the same thing and set a rounding of 10 centimeters and then I'm also going to just sort out my subdivisions again so let me just pull this up so let's put one there um right okay so inside of my caps type let's go to regular grid quad dominant I'm gonna leave it maybe like eight inside of here we're going to go to subdividers it's all the stuff that we've basically just gone through angle of 90 I'm not even going to change that value <laughs> and then we'll increase our subdivisions okay cool so this let's just see let's see how we go with this right cool so what we want to do I'm going to right click my text and I'm going to simulation tags I'm going to go to soft body and then inside my soft body there are a bunch of different kind of settings and so structural shear and flexion are all of the kind of like spring um soft body settings that will help um whether we're kind of like making something um stay keep its shape or kind of um, lose its shape uh, all of these are going to kind of come into play but the thing that we want to look at is actually this shape conservation and this pressure setting so if I kind of change, you know, what, I might even let's switch this off for now and just see kind of what it does. Let's put a pressure value of like 20. And we're gonna go press play. And it's gonna be a little bit slow. And it's kind of expanding out and it's going to fall out of the sky. So let's switch off our gravity. I'm gonna come back. I have a quick question. Yeah. Is there any reason, um, this is a, from Nick, is there any reason why you use a plane instead of a floor when you set up your scene? Um, just what I'm used to, preference. I guess. Yeah, yeah it's, just, it's just preference, that's it. Cool, thank you. Um, cool, right, so we've increased our pressure value to 20. And so, do you know what? I don't even need to have this rotated, do I? Let's have a better angle. So we're going to press play and this is the downside to soft body is as you can see it's a little bit slower but it's i mean it's working and so this is another way of creating that inflate effect what we can see is we're getting kind of some strange kind of bits around here and basically it's it's a mix between adjusting these settings versus these settings. So if we want to maintain the shape, so if we had some polygons flying out, which um, can happen, we would want to up our volume conservation. So let's maybe up this to something like five. And what this is gonna do, it's gonna, it's gonna maintain its volume as much as physically possible. And so as we can see now, it's kind of keeping its S shape a lot better. Um, so what else could we do? We could we could lower our flexion. Um, and so we get more of this kind of um, spring effect happening. And so to prevent this kind of effect from happening, you would just have to up your subdivisions or put it in a subdivision surface. But then again, it's going to be a little bit slower. This is kind of why we don't often show software dynamics because it is... It, you can create some really amazing effects, but the downside is um, things aren't necessarily as fast um, as, you know, using the uh, displace away. Yeah, and normally if, to be honest, if I ever use soft body dynamics, I have a tendency of using another cheat as well, which is the... Um, yes, that is quite... The former, the mesh deformer. Um, because it just saves time and funnily enough Cinema 4D can calculate a low poly object with this 
faster driving a high poly object than driving a high poly object with just soft body on it automatically it's it's a strange workaround but it does work it is quite a cool one did you want to uh show yeah so got sure minutes, thing so yeah we've got 10 minutes if you throw the screen and we can um we can always do yeah. it another time okay yeah no i've got 10 minutes it'll do it yeah yeah so if you throw the screen at me uh, let me check it over okay cool thank you very much so no worries the workflow i'm about to show it does work for other things but it, it just requires a little bit more setup but it does end up being faster so what i'm going to use i'm going to use a sphere obviously and i'm going to show you how many polygons this thing has which is what 16 so let's times that by four if you didn't know you can do maths in these things by doing the little multiply the, the star sign and then times four and press enter and it will do math so i have effectively my high poly sphere i'm going to select the two of them right click on my sphere and i'm going to go to simulation tags and i'm going to go to soft body gulp i hear you say and i'm going to press play unpleasant shall we say as my computer slowly figures out one brain at a bouncy time yeah i'm already bored of that so stop and go back to the beginning so i have a high poly sphere i'm just going to get rid of the dynamics tab for a moment i'm going to create a copy of this sphere so i now have two this one i'm going to call high because it's got high and this one i'm going to call low and i'm going to put that back to being 16. now i have to use this as a cage but the cage because of the way the polygons work needs to be bigger so every single point of the high poly needs to be inside the low poly. Okay, so that's the only way that this will work. Um, if it doesn't, if it sticks outside, then it will go a little bit strange. So I just wanna see if I can shrink it a smidge because the smaller it is, the closer to the original value, the more accurate the settings will be now i can't quite tell if that's inside or out i know it's displaying as out but sometimes the viewport lies so what i'm going to do on the low poly i'm going to create my simulation tag my soft body and i'm just going to hide the high poly one so now if i press play bloomf, okay simple you know that was like really fast in almost instantaneous calculation the high poly one it ground to a halt but what I'm going to do with my high poly, I'm going to add a deformer. And that deformer I'm going to use is, which I now need to find because it's moved. Why can my brain not? A mesh deformer, there it is. Uh, on the right hand side, and this mesh deformer goes inside the high poly because I wish to deform the high poly object. The mesh deformer says, what cage do you want me to use? Basically, what object are you going to want me to follow? And that's the low poly object where I click and drag it into there. And then I'm going to press initialize and it'll do a few things. One of which is add a compositing tag and hide everything from the low poly cage. So I can no longer see the, high, the low poly cage. It's got a, a preview bounding box there. But if I turn off my wireframe, you can see it's got the preview, but the high frame is not there. And now if I press play, you can, yeah, wow, you can see that the low poly cage was just ever so slightly not large enough. So I'm going to have to go back to my mesh deformer. I'm going to have to restore, and then I'm going to need to increase that a smidge. Mm. Actually, I'm going to delete that. I need to delete it first. And then I'm going to increase that to make sure it's definitely larger. Then in the mesh, drag and drop that, reinitialize, press play. There we go. There is a slight lag behind, but that is now driving a high poly mesh much faster. Yeah, we've got this. a little bit I of- I love this workaround because it's just yeah, so quick. It's, 
it's so easy and so fast in comparison to what the other one was and how slow that was but it is actually now driving a high poly mesh and i've done that with things like cabling tires and all sorts of other things people have done it with high poly faces and stuff uh, so using the mesh deformer as a cage just works really well yeah Matt, so out of curiosity, Jarvis is wondering, um, you've probably worked with SoftBody a lot more than I have. Um, would you like normally bake your SoftBody animations to avoid like all the lag? Um, I mean, yeah, but you do that with everything. I mean, this is my first workaround for anything to do with lag. Um, certainly when it comes I to SoftBody yeah, stuff. Everything. I'll bake a lot of and stuff. And then cash. Like sims. Yeah, um, you just find that that's just a habit you get used to. If you're doing any form of simulation, once you get it to a state that you're happy with, you just press bake um, and then you can scrub through and then everything is much faster. And I can hide that entirely now. Yeah, or well, if you're working with like volumes and you're lowering yeah. like voxel sizes, just get used to yeah, baking or caching um, once you're happy, of course, with it. Yes. But you can always delete. Like with good good form of caching, you can always then just delete it and recache if you make any changes. Hmm. Okay. Right. Cool. I think that's us done then, isn't it? If I'm if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Shall I I'll grab the screen back and do my little okay. what's happening next week? Hi. <laughs> right. Um cool. Let me do that. Okay. Oh, show my screen. You all, um, can you see my screen? Is that, is that kicked in? Yes. Lovely. Right. So, um, so next week. Also, um, thanks Matt for all of this really cool stuff, and thanks everyone for your great questions and kind of the stuff that we get to work out live. Um, because even though we have like a set plan, there is no reason why we have to stick to it, or we can kind of like defer and actually make things that you guys really want to see like that's that's definitely a lot of fun uh, for us to do as well so next week is week five and it is all things to do with MoGraph um and so we kind mm. of touched on I, I mean yeah no surprise it is um definitely my favorite topic so I am really looking forward to next week um so yeah, you know, we've touched on a few things already. So Matt showed us the Voronoi fracture and we had a couple of questions about it and kind of how to add more segments. And don't worry, that's going to be a very big kind of topic of next week. And we also had a little look at kind of adding fields, but we're going to kind of really uh, start to embrace them a lot more um, within the MoGraph workflow next week. So other things we'll look at is um, the cloner, which is another um, really powerful uh, tool things uh, that are called effectors. And we're also gonna create a bunch of different MoGraph setups. So there are a variety of different things that we can make. Um, and so we're gonna have a look at kind of creating a, a few different scenes instead of just sticking to just kind of like the one, the one technique. Um, and there will be some project files. So um, my apologies, we've been busy kind of updating our Dropbox. So I didn't actually have the time to upload today's project file. Um, ready for this session, but it's going to be on there later today or kind of worst case scenario um, tomorrow, ready for when the session is also on YouTube. And then I'll make sure these um, these project files are on there ready for next week too. So you guys can you know, have those, break them down. And one of them is going to be um, this kind of like bubble scene that we can see on the right hand side. Uh, we're going to create that um, with a couple of different things. Um, so yeah, as always, it's been an absolute pleasure and thanks to you as well, Matt. Um, and for You're anyone welcome. who uh, does want to like post any work, a few people asked earlier about our hashtag and it is just hashtag how on. We love to see what you're up to, whether it's related to the course or not. Um, just drop us a tag and we'll definitely check that out. So uh, it's been a pleasure, everyone, and um, enjoy the rest of your week. Enjoy the rest of your days, whether it's early or late for you, and we will see you all next week. Yeah. All right. Take care, guys. See you all. Bye, everyone. Bye.